season has been brought to you by Radisson Red, Johannesburg, Rosebank. Style you can bank on. Great day, everyone. Ed Dudley. You already know. Durham, North Carolina. It's an amazing Friday. I'm always excited because I always say that if I'm above ground, it's a great day, regardless of what goes on around me. And plus, I get to spend some time with my one and only approved girlfriend, Miss Charmaine Supermoney. How you doing? I'm fabulous, Silo Ed. It's always amazing to be in your company. Yeah. Hello, everyone. It's just me, Charmaine, connecting from Johannesburg, <laughs> South Africa. How's your week been? It's It's been fabulous. It's been good. Busy, but good. Good. Um, good. I look forward to our Friday conversations, actually. And um, as you know, Zulu Ed, um, advancing, supporting, and empowering women is one of my core areas. And I'm so excited about today's conversation because I think you and I are pretty privileged to be I speaking to. I think we are, to too. I think we are too. To, to the CEO and president of the Women's World Bank, Mary Ellen Iskandarian. Let's I mean, I think. In. Let's just bring her on in. <laughs> Mary Hello, Ellen, Mary how Ellen. are you? <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> oh, welcome to the Ubuntu House. Um, we, we are privileged to have you in our company. Um, yeah, I think you should just tell us a little bit about yourself before we delve into the work bits, if any. Sure, sure. Um, so Thank it's, you. It's terrific to be with you. I was actually in Durham for the first time a couple of months ago. And boy, Ed, you mentioned that eating was a sport for you. You can eat oh, yeah. really oh, well. Yeah. Sure, oh, yeah. Oh, very well. And I'm, I'm going to eat very well to this evening. <laughs> uh, but um, no, it's it's a, it's really exciting to, um, to be t talking with you. And I just found out yesterday, I don't know how I'd kind of lost track of these dates, but uh, the 12th, so earlier this week, was my 16th year as president and CEO of Women's World Banking. And I have to say, we have to have that ING at the end because it's kind of a fun story. Our founder wanted to, rec wanted to register ourselves in exactly the way you said, Charmaine, Women's World Bank. And the um, the banking authorities in New York, where we were first registered, got all up in arms. We're not a bank. We're a, a nonprofit organization, and so we have this odd banking uh, title. But um, we are a, we are a nonprofit organization that, since our founding in 1979, has been committed to making sure that that all women, in particular low income women in developing countries, have access to all the financial services and products that they need so that they can prosper and be secure. So it's not just about microloans and uh, getting getting debt into women's hands. It's about savings. It's about insurance. It's about saving towards retirement. Um, so the full breadth of, of exactly the full package of services that you and I have, um, we want to make sure that all women have access to. That's wonderful. May Mary Ellen, did I hear correct? Founded in 1979. Yeah, we've been around a really long time, and um, I'm I am the third president, and I think it it speaks um, speaks volumes really to the organization. Um, you know, in 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 part, I've been able to steward these this these last several years, but to have had such strong leadership, you know, throughout our um, throughout our life, and you know, it's. It's been a really interesting few years. Um, you've seen a lot of really iconic women's organizations mm. around the world really struggle these last few years. So I'm I'm very I'm, I'm proud, but I'm also really grateful that we our mission has remained relevant. That um, we've been able to um, highlight how important the issue of 
financial inclusion, economic participation is to generations of, of women, generations of employees. You know, we have always had a wonderful, wonderful staff who've kind of met the moment that we're in. Yeah. You know, I, I'd love to lo learn a little bit more about your story. You know, how, what landed you to this position in, at the, at the World, Women's World Banking? Because I see that you had to stop at Lehman. I remember Lehman. I, I've been in the financial industry for a little while. Um, and I said, I, oh, she was at Lehman. So, I mean, what got you from, you know, the Lehman of the world to the, this global nonprofit? Yeah, I think I'd be, be doing sort of penance for, <laughs> for, <that. laughs> for my investment banking career. But, you know, but I do give it, you know, I realize now kind of in retrospect how incredibly valuable it was, you know, um, investment banks and, and sort of the kind of bank that Lehman Brothers was, I was there when it was still a, a partnership. Um, you know, you're talking to CFOs, CEOs of, of large companies, of, of startup companies who are trying to make the most critical financial decisions about moving forward with their company. So I learned a huge amount in the time that I was there. But there's a story that I often tell about my time there. Um, it was a memorable deal, perhaps because it was the first deal I ever worked on where I wasn't the most junior person on the team. And I had uh, I had someone working with me and he, we had been hired by a large truck trucking company, truck manufacturing company to identify a candidate to, um, to acquire. So another company they wanted to acquire. And we'd identified a, a bunch of possibilities and I sent him off to design a little model to see, you know, what would our client and each of these five um, possible target companies look like when they were combined. And I checked in with him a couple of days before our meeting with the client. And he had this very fancy model and he was very excited to show it to me. And at the bottom of the balance sheet, there was this different number under each of the five, um, five uh, models. And he would change them as he made different changes to the to the assumptions. And I said, well, you know, what are you, what are you doing to get your balance sheet to balance? What's that plug figure? And he said, oh, well, that's how many people will have to lay off in order to make the deal work. And it like, it's, I know it makes me sound a little naive. You know, I'd gone through business school. I'd been working in banking for a while, but it just hit me at that moment. Like, this is not why I have gone into finances to, to make, deals work and earn big fees on transactions that are going to result in people losing their jobs. And so it became pretty much a focus of my time immediately after that to find um, the next thing I was going to do yeah. with this great education and, and background that I'd acquired. I don't, my undergraduate work had been in development economics, and I took a, a shot at applying to something called the Young Professionals Program at the World Bank which um, tends not to take Americans, actually. It's one of their, their great ways of bringing in young talent from, um, from the developing world, from countries that, that the bank is serving. And to my amazement, I got into the program. My not very nice investment banker boss, when I went to him to resign, um, said to me, well, I don't know how you got in. You're not young or particularly professional. So I was like, okay, I have made the right decision to leave, <laughs> to leave this place. Um, the only, the only um, sort of redeeming part of that story is um, he and I actually stayed in touch and he invited me to his 25th wedding anniversary a few years ago. And I, um, I told his mother that story. I told <laughs> <laughs> so I got, I got back, I got mine back, but long story short, I, I went to the world bank, very, you know, uh, idealistic about what I might be able to accomplish. And then, you know, quite excitingly, like literally four months later, the Berlin wall came down and they realized they had this person with all of this investment banking and capital markets experience. And so literally for the next eight years, I worked on rebuilding capital markets, rebuilding financial sectors first in Eastern Europe, and then eventually in the former Soviet Union. I worked a lot in Ukraine, for example, um, starting up stock exchanges. I worked on the first um, IPO that they did in Poland 
Um, and it was actually kind of interesting. The stock exchange in Poland very explicitly chose to set themselves up in the former KGB headquarters in Warsaw because they really wanted to make the point that they were now a capitalist country. <laughs> um, it was just a fascinating time to be in that part of the world. Uh, you, you, know, you knew very quickly that it was a moment in history, but it also showed me really how much finance can be a positive force, a positive change. You know, nobody in any of those countries had ever thought that, you know, going to a bank for a loan to start a business was something they could do. You know, banks were kind of where you kept your money and, you know, so you didn't get, didn't have to keep it at home kind of thing. There was no mm -hmm. sense of a bank joining you in achieving, you know, your aspirations. And so, it was um, it was just a tremendous experience. I worked throughout, like you know, those eight years. I then worked uh, for a while in in Latin America. I worked um, in. I became the regional director for South Asia, and my my fourth day on the job there was was nine eleven, and so I ended up actually, even though I was living in Delhi, I spent a lot of that first year in um in pakistan and i'm very proud that our first sort of post 9 11 investment was a microfinance bank in pakistan with the aga khan foundation and that was really in in, in part i had done some microfinance in latin america but that was really my first introduction to the role that you know small loans being able to accept very small deposits, the kind of that that the the ability to do transactions at the size that these people needed them to be done could be so important in in people's lives. And so just to bring us full circle, um, you know, I, I was kind of climbing along in my career at the bank, and it just felt the longer I was there, the further and further away I got from the people that I really loved working with, the people whose lives I, I hoped I was making a change in. And it seemed like my job was to, you know, sort of protect, spread my wings to protect the people working for me, doing the really cool stuff. And I had to work with all of the people above me. And so when a headhunter called and offered um, an opportunity to run this organization, in um, you know women's world banking, I kind of leapt at the chance, and I'm still I'm so grateful that the board took a chance on me because I just had never really focused on women, and it was um, immediately apparent to me as soon as I started meeting the banks and microfinance institutions and women's world banking's network that I saw you know, it really was women who were doing the hard work of economic development, who were making sure the kids stayed in school, making sure everybody's health care was covered, making sure that there was housing, there was good food. You know, there was it was so clear that that was the work of women in the developing world. And so I knew I'd made the right decision. And I'm just so glad that the board uh, trusted me and has continued to do so for these last 16 years. I mean, your share is phenomenal. Mary Ellen. I mean, the experience going from Lehman and it kind of figures as to why Lehman is no longer. And I mean, they went under in 2008. The culture, if not the foundation's not great, it's unlikely you're going to survive many things, right? I can leave Lehman out of this. <laughs> For another podcast. Um, the work that you do and the comment that you actually made, it, it is women that actually makes the greatest impact in the lives of people in developing countries. And I'm a testament to that. I mean, my ability to understand finance, even though I did my master's in finance, is was I learned from my mom, actually, watching her distribute money, save money, um, how she managed the household, and how she ensured that my brothers and I get educated with very little money. She started off as a one of the work, one of the jobs that she did was actually a maid um, during those apartheid eras. So, so, so that's my background. So, a woman has the potential to be able to make this mammoth difference to one's life if they understand money well. So, I'm so excited. I'm, I'm always excited that you are supporting women across the globe to be able to provide them with 
the resources to, in order to do so. I would love for you to just like unpack that. What does it actually look like and what does it mean? And for some people who don't understand the concept of microfinance, I do come from South Africa, um, just maybe explain that. Why microfinance? So I, 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 I'm not sure why Pakistan is so much in my mind today. Yeah. I think because we're all just so devastated at seeing this country, you know, yeah. just completely underwater. But let me tell you about a piece of work that we did a few years ago in Pakistan, because I think it, it, it highlights very nicely um, not only the work that we do, but why doing it with women is, is yeah. so important. Um, so there was a, so the, the biggest development in making sure that poor, poorer people have access to financial services, you know, in the last 15 years has been the introduction of mobile money. And it's very exciting that it really was started on the continent of Africa with M-Pesa. It really is an era, area that, that, um, Africa has led the way, which is, was mm -hmm. really very exciting. That was but a Kenyan. It was a Kenyan innovation, exactly, but yeah. has now really spread across the yeah. continent. And you saw um, this, the lar largest mobile money um, company, mobile cell phone company in, in Pakistan, really wanting to embrace the, the millions of Pakistanis who um, were lacking access to financial services. They have um, really have one of the, the the biggest rates of financial exclusion in, in the mm -hmm. world. They recognize the need to bring this group into the financial services um, industry. And they also recognize this big gender gap. And even with this intention, they were having a really bad time. Only 12% of their customers were actually using financial services that were available on their cell phone. And I, I still think that the reason they were even focused on this is that they had a woman chief technology officer. And it really, that's a, a very important piece of our work is making sure that, that women are in leadership positions in financial services companies, because we find that they tend to be more aware of women as clients as well. And so yeah. she hired us thinking she needed kind of a pink product. She needed a women's product because you know, I'm only reaching 12% with what I have. And so we looked at their data and it turned out that no, those 12% women were using the same product lines, payments, savings, micro loans at the same levels that the men were and um, quite profitably for the company. So it, what, they didn't really need a new product, but what they did need was that in this very, very conservative, you know, very restrictive social norms, culture for women, the way they brought customers into their business was they had agents in little shops around the country and a woman would have to go, you know, into that shop. 97% of the agents that they had in their network across the company country were men. So a woman would have to go into a shop, like just the single proprietorship, just one man in this little shop. And then if she was brave enough to do that on her own, then she had to give him her cell phone number. And that was not going to happen. And her husbands were not happy about that. The women themselves weren't happy about that. So we knew from some work we'd done in a few other countries that um, Unilever, the big consumer goods company, had a program where they had set up a network of 1,000 women owned shops around the country. They had done a really good job in picking women who were very respected and trusted in their communities. We trained those women as agents in, uh, as, as cell phone agents and, and mobile money agents. And then they were, were the, the, the agents that these women customers were much more comfortable working with. We also looked at some of their marketing and this was fascinating to me that, but it, it, it's something again, we've seen in lots of places, women were very sensitive to the language of advertisement and, and a referral from another woman was really, really effective with, with women customers or a language that would say, you know, join, you know, thousands of other women in making your financial life easier or something, but referring to women in the marketing 
was hugely important to women, men couldn't care less. In fact, even the language that referred to women, we saw men responding at the same levels that they had with more gender neutral language. And we've seen that in so many places that very often, if you solve for things that are really important for women in your product design and your marketing, men are fine with it. Sometimes they even like it better, but it doesn't work the other way around. Very often, you know, doing something that's going to appeal to men will really be a turnoff for, for women clients. So between a big change in their marketing and then this very um, important change in their agent network, we were able to raise the percentage of women clients from 12% to 46% in less than six months. I mean, it was immediate. There was a huge unpent, uh, pent up demand there. And it was, again, not affluent, wealthy women. It was yeah. really grassroots level women. So, you know, I think just to take away from that, just being really, really um, conscious and focused on what it is that women need to see, need to have addressed when you're designing a product, making it e easy and comfortable for them to understand it, for them to get to it. Um, you don't necessarily need, a, as I say, sort of a pink product or pink washing. You need um, to really respond to the needs of women. And we're just, there's all sorts of great data now that's showing women taking up digital financial services at a faster rate than men, and then staying with them longer, the loyalty to that um, that digital financial service being greater um, for women than for men. Because it meets all sorts of things that women like. It's, it's, it's certainly convenient, it's um, secure, um, and it's confidentiality. That's something we hear from women all over the world. Like, don't let my husband know that I'm saving <laughs> and what I'm saving for. And if she's on the cell phone, she has more control over keeping that information. To See, now you're going to have me check in my wife to see if she's got some money hidden to the side. So uh, let me, yeah. let me write, a, yeah. write a, wrote a note down. <laughs> I actually share this with every woman that I come across, actually, that you do yeah. have to have a kitty that it's you put important. aside that nobody knows about. So. It's important. And it, and it is important that you actually do it. it yeah. And there's multiple, we're not going to go into that, but there's multiple yeah. reasons for doing so. Yeah. Mary Ellen, a quick question. Pakistan, as a result of it being a Muslim country, the way of actually engaging is very different to other non-Muslim countries. Did you find the same recipe of success in other countries or, or something else worked better, especially in light of not wanting to go into a shop that was managed by a male? Was it specific to Muslim countries or did you find it... Um, it's, that's a great question. Actually, we're seeing incredible results with training women agents, particularly for digital, um, you know, for these di digital products in in so many places, okay. Muslim, not and non non Muslim. Okay. And you know, this is so interesting. I, this is so counterintuitive to the way I would have thought, but men are telling us, no, no, I like going to the woman. She can explain you know, how to use the technology very clearly. And if I have a stupid question, I'm more comfortable asking the woman than another man, which yeah. I, that I just really wouldn't have expected. And so we're, that's a very big piece of the work we're doing is, is training more women to be digital financial um, agents. But the other piece about the, the Pakistan project that, that I think works so well that does carry across all other countries is taking something that people are, are comfortable with and that they understand and is in their culture and then just, you know, maybe a, a tweaking it for a way that women can use it, yeah. tweaking it for a way that allows the technology. Um, you know, one of the things that we're doing in, in Indonesia, now gr granted another Muslim majority country, but, um, you know, sort of l less restrictive in many ways than, than say, say a Pakistan. We learned just sort of through our, our, um, our Indonesian staff that it's a, a very common custom in, in Indonesia, particularly in rural areas, for women to save every month when they go to visit the midwife when they're pre when they're pregnant so they sort of save throughout that period to pay for the delivery cost and any any health care that might 
um, be necessary out of the out of the birth of the child. And so you're sort of working on that same process of like adapting something that's already in the culture. We've trained midwives in Indonesia on basically being digital agents. So the women are now saving with the midwife on the phone. And the midwife has a little bit of extra income coming in because she's now the digital agent for a bank or a fintech in that in that rural area. So it's actually working out really, really well to have more of these women agents, re, you know, regardless of um, of the environment we're doing it. Yeah, it's so, so powerful. No, go ahead, Charmaine. Sorry, uh, just a quick, like yeah. you are finding solutions to their already existing, I wouldn't call it challenges, like paying the woman, but you, you've actually made it easier um, in terms through your di digital medium. So so I like the fact that you are, your organization is aware of what's actually happening and creating solutions to those problems. Mm -hmm. So thank you for doing that. Yeah. Thank you. So, so there's a big buzzword going around here in the States um, around inclusion. And I know that you are an advocate for women in, in the finance world. Can you talk a little bit about one financial inclusion? You know, a lot of people don't understand what it means. And can you just explain to our audience what financial inclusion means and why is it important? Oh, thank you for asking that because it's such a wonky term, and and it, it, it I think it maybe um, puts more people off than it invites. It, it it the term itself is perhaps excluding, um, and I talk a lot about this in 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 the book actually. So the the technical definition, you know, sort of what the Fed in the United States or you know the Reserve Bank in South Africa would call financial inclusion is, do you have a bank account or a mobile money account in your own name. But at, at Women's World Banking, and, and I think in you know the, the community that I work in, we know that just having an account really doesn't mean anything at all. It doesn't mean that you're part of the financial system. Because we know that people need a you know sort of safe, convenient, affordable way to, to um, send money. And you know, around the world, remittances are an enormous source of income for, for, for people, so a way to receive money, a safe place to save money, so not in the mattress, but, but to, to save the money safely. Loans are important. They're just not the only thing that's important. And I think that's where microfinance maybe lost its way a, a bit. Sure. But um, loans that allow you to make you know, large purchases, or if you're a business, to grow your business, and then insurance to make sure that you don't um, you don't lose everything that you've built if the breadwinner in a family becomes sick or or, or passes on. So we think of inclu financial inclusion as really having access to an affordable way to to touch all of those those products to not be overly penalized with you know punitive interest rates, really high usurious interest rates, not to be subject to uh, predatory um, collection um, mechanisms. So really, you know, making sure that there's a certain amount of consumer protection um, in, in involved. So that whole um, suite of products and services is is what we think of as being included in the financial system. So financial inclusion um, en encompasses that whole range of things. Yeah, that's great. And, and I know you talk about five steps that businesses should take to promote financial inclusion. Can you share those five steps with us? Oh dear. Okay. So I don't, I'm, <laughs> yeah. you're ahead of me. You're ahead of me here. Um, <laughs> um, I'm going to see if I can remember things. No, I think, you know, a lot of our work um, is, is really about convincing the financial sector and financial service providers that women are a good business, loyal customers, um, that don't have to, um, you, you don't have to um, only think of them as charity cases or put them in your corporate social responsibility or your foundation, that there's a business to be, to be made. Um, and so, you know, I talk about, you know, in, in the book, ways of thinking about this as a as a market you know the reason i uh, the, the the thinking behind the title there's nothing micro about a billion women you know there's research that's been done now that shows if if men and women had 
equal access to financial services. So not, not, I'm not even saying all unserved women, but just men and women at parity, it would unlock $700 billion of revenues annually for the financial service sector. That is more than twice what Elon Musk is worth. <laughs> it's well in excess of what even the largest banks of the in the world um, are generating in terms of revenue um, every year. So it's it's a, a really meaningful um, amount of money. One of our our Women's World Banking uh, insure um, researchers made a, a really interesting point. So right now we know that there are 740 million women in the developing world that have no access whatsoever. If they were just to get access to that account and save nothing more than $20, and $20 actually is probably a really low ball when we think about ways that people in, in developing countries save informally. You know, they'll save by buying livestock or, you know, women in, in India for generations have been saving through, you know, gold bangles, gold jewelry. So if you if you just saved, um, you know, 20, um, $20 each, that would be something like $42 billion worth of additional deposits that could then be used to lend out, to, you know, to do whatever banks do with the money that, um, that is put on deposit with them. So there, these numbers are now so large that it really makes sense for businesses to look seriously at, at making these products work for women. I'm with you on this. I mean, you speaking to the converted in South Africa, because of our legacy of discrimination, women were not allowed bank accounts, right? And how do they say it? in the, you would know probably Mary Ellen, the stock fell. Right, where they right. just group their money and they'd be able to utilize it to send their kids to school or start little businesses, depending. Um, and now, um, as a result of legislative changes, the banks have actually are trying to draw into that money as a result of it being like a millions of rands um, mm -hmm. industry. So, yeah. So talking to your point, just confirmation here in South Africa, that's actually happening. Mary Ellen, just practically, right? So from a microfinance perspective and what you guys actually do. So how many countries in the world do you guys serve? Um, and in addition to prov providing microfinance, is there coaching for businesses? Does your organization provide that? <clears throat> Great question. So um, we are currently working in 35 developing countries and the principal way we work is by bringing financial service providers into our network and sharing all of our research, all of our learnings, you know, everything we do, we share with that whole sure, community. I can. Um, today, 30% of those 68 uh, financial service providers are, are fintechs, so very, very focused on, um, on digital. Banks, insurance companies, payment companies, mobile, um, mobile phone companies, so the v very broad range of partners because Financial services now have been disrupted, and you know whoever kind of has that that supply chain, the midwife, you know anybody who's got that customer contact, is kind of fair game for thinking mm. about the delivery of, of of financial services. We work, um, we and we work sort of in a couple of ways. The product development work that I just mentioned, we're kind of like a, you know. I always tell my staff that we're consultants with an agenda. <laughs> so you know, we'll kind of work as um, in that consulting work. But about a decade ago, we um, we started actually as an investor as well. We raised our first impact um, investment fund, fifty million dollars, hardest money I've ever raised in my life. We Congratulations! Now it's not easy. <laughs> it really isn't. Um, it's amazing when people actually want to get their money back, how much harder it is <laughs> than when I'm asking for grants. But um, we now have a second fund. We closed just oh, last nice. April, $103 million, so we may be able to double that. Where we're taking, we're actually taking, you know, equity stakes in financial institutions. We're sitting at the board. We're really actively making sure that these companies that we're engaged with, um, you know, are delivering women as yeah. customers and they're promoting diversity in their, in their ranks as well. So 
more women in staff, women in leadership, women on the board. And the thing that's been so so exciting as an investor is it's much more than a just, you know, women's world banking to to bank relationship. If we're in a capital round, all of those other investors are coming in and asking for the same things and putting the same kinds of you know, commitments in the CEO's bonus plan. You know, you don't get the bonus if you don't hire that third woman on your um, on your senior leadership team. And we that is a really important, powerful way to incentivize um, leaders to you know to do the right thing. Um, so that's been a, a very exciting development. And I think probably right now the the most coaching that we're doing is with the management and leadership of these companies where we're an investor. Thank you. It, Go ahead, Charmaine. I know. It's, it's good to actually see that there's involvement and you'll be able to, to ensure that what the vision and mission is, is actually being exercised out there. So thank mm -hmm. you for sharing that. Um, Mary Ellen, so you've, you've been in the finance world. You've been doing amazing things you've had the opportunity to travel the world and have an impact and you spoke about your ipos and all of that i mean that's incredible learnings for yourself but an incredible experience right and you have the world bank doing phenomenal things and you're really adding value to in my opinion um, and from what you've shared um, really adding value and seeing women that are underserved and that is a beautiful thing and you also appreciate and respect the value that they are able to bring into the economy as a whole globally so tell me a little bit of why you wrote that amazing book that you did well I, it, first of all what's the title of the book yeah, for the people thank, that are listening thank you thank you ed it, the name of the book is there's nothing micro about a billion women making finance work for women um, and it's, uh, it was published by MIT Press, came out at the end of April of this year. Um, so I think it, it was motivated by, by a couple of things. I felt like, like I know a lot, you know, I know a lot of these things, they're in my brain, but I wanted to get it down on paper. I wanted to be able to point, um, you know, sort of to a, to a single source to say, you know, this is, this is certainly women's world banking's work, but this is my thinking on sure. these issues. I also wanted to situate the things that we were seeing on the ground anecdotally. I wanted to try to situate that in the broader context of research. And so you'll, you'll see in the book, there's just a lot of reference to research where I'll talk about something that, you know, a woman has told us or that we've seen um, on the ground and then see, is it indeed supported in a you know sort of more rigorous um, con research context? And then I guess the third reason was that there are some issues that I, I that are very meaningful to me personally that you know sort of women's world banking hasn't kind of gotten our way to yet. And then one of those really is the the linkage between women's financial security and their fi their physical security oh, yeah. and the the research. Unfortunately, believe it or not, it's, you know, it's something that I think we all know intuitively that, you know, a woman will stay in an abusive relationship or oh, go yeah. back into an abusive relationship because she doesn't have the economic wherewithal to stay out of it. But the research is very equivocal. The research says in some places, women make themselves more vulnerable to violence if they are seen as having money in their own names. And so I, I just wanted to, to throw some light on this, open a discussion around it, look at what the research was saying, um, look at sort of what we were seeing, you know, on the ground. We did some work with a bank in, in Colombia that was supposed to be part of a very rigorous randomized control trial with a, a team of economists from, from Princeton. But quite frankly, they started adding a lot of, you know, ornaments to the Christmas tree and it became really hard to, to say, you know, were these women safer as a result of having a savings account in their own name that their husbands might not necessarily know about? And so it was a, I was very disappointed that we weren't able to draw more, you know, um, empirical uh, evidence. evidence. 
But when I went to talk to the, the bank, they, um, they immediately called in the woman who runs their foundation because they were seeing a very definite trend that the point at which, you know, not every woman, not every woman is an abused woman, but, every, but with many women, when their bank accounts reached about $100 equivalent in Colombian pesos, the women were leaving and they were taking the kids. And one thing that was really wonderful about the study is it had um, every six months, the women had sort of general health checkups. So we did have a pretty good sense of who might be in a, a dangerous position. But what they were doing when they were leaving is they were coming to the bank. And so this is where the woman from the foundation said, it's become a really important part of their outreach to the community. They have um, come up with partnerships for shelters. They help the, the mothers get the kids situated in new schools. They have a whole job training program for the women who've been able to, to get out of those, those situations. Yes. So, you know, even though we weren't able to like crunch the numbers and show the, you know, the hard data, certainly what we saw on the ground was very compelling that, you know, when women feel financially secure, they'll get themselves out of a situation where they're not physically secure. You know, I, I know you saw both Charmaine and I smiling as you started talking about financial abuse, um, because we are both advocates um, for women in particular that have dealt with um, or are currently dealing with some form of abuse. So thank you for talking about that financial abuse because it's something that's not talked about nearly enough because a lot of women stay simply because of finances. Yeah, so I'm, yeah no, and I'm, I'm actually kind of hopeful and I mean, we're all like very sad to see Serena stepping down from, um, from professional tennis. But she's she and Venus actually have been quite vocal um, in speaking out about this. Their older sister was the the victim of um, domestic violence, financial abuse, and they both talk so movingly about realizing the importance of financial independence, financial knowledge, financial. Um, safety and physical safety. So I'm I'm kind of excited that we we may have recruited a a very powerful voice spokesperson. Yeah, into this into this space as she goes on to whatever the next thing is going to be that she does. That's great. I mean, just I mean, I, I tend to talk to women quite often that ha that are in abusive relationships in terms of some of the work that I actually do, and most of them are. As you mentioned, uh, Mary Ellen, they are not financially secure. And even money that they've actually earned is not handled by them. Right. That's right. the problem. Um, so there's a lot of challenges in that space. Um, yeah. I Eight think this a whole, that's a whole nother conversation that I think we need to have. No, bring, her back and, and bring her back and talk about that. Really important one. There's so many, like uh, some people may go, why are you guys so focused on women? It's just that women have not had, I mean, from an equity point of view, there's so much work still to be done. And we've always been on the back foot with regard to opening of bank accounts, with regards to the gender pay gap and all of that. So um, it just excites me and it gives me so much hope that organizations like yourself is actually helping women um, become financially free and independent if they utilize their money as well. It does come with um, financial illiteracy as well, does it, um, yeah, Mary Ellen? Because yeah. it's very important. Giving people money is one thing, but knowing how to handle it is so exactly. important to be able to utilize it in an effective and impactful way to benefit themselves. So well, yeah. Absolutely. We, and that, when we were talking earlier about product design, that, that financial capability is embedded right in there, making yeah. sure that the woman un understands how the product works. And frankly, today, you, you can't really talk about financial literacy and not talk about digital literacy. And making Absolutely. sure that, you know, she knows how to navigate that, that smartphone and that she knows how and has confidence in, in maneuvering, not just the money part of it, but the technology part as well. Marilyn, you've been in this beautiful role for like 16 years. What is the one success story you'd love to share with us that stands out for you? I, I think I, I alluded to it earlier. I'm really proud 
that we've been able to pivot the organization to be not just the provider of advice, but an investor as well. Um, because just the, you know, the sort of the stickiness of what we're trying to do it just is so much greater when we're inside the company, when we're an investor, oh, when yeah. we're others inside um, the company with us, with that that mandate. Um, and it's been, I think it's been a, a really exciting opportunity really for the nonprofit part of our business for us to be an investor because, you know, we can share so much of the, the research and the work that we do, you know, on our, on our nonprofit side with with our our investee companies um we were very fortunate with this last fund this 100 million dollar fund that we received a a pool of of grant money from uh, two of our investors and so for each of our companies that we invest in we do two pieces of work and this is what the nonprofit side looks at is one are, is the company doing everything it can to attract retain and promote um, women in inside the company, and then mm -hmm. we look at are they doing everything to address the women's market that they 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 could be, and then we take sort of those two diagnostic pieces of work and we design with management a gender action plan, and then help them realize make the that and that's again that's sort of the advisory side of our business. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really not just been exciting to be an investor because of the impact we can have with the investment, but it's made Women's World Banking as a whole a stronger, more relevant um, organization that, that can really affect change and make it stick. I love that. <laughs> I love it, actually. It's... I see Ada has a question. <laughs> oh, I always have questions. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, so, you know, when you agreed to join our show, you know, I did a little research on you, of course. Uh -oh. And um, I saw a story that you talked about um, your early days of growing up yeah. as a first generation American. <laughs> I, I, you know, I because I love hearing personal stories about, you know, because it's it's typically the beginning of what our why. We do a lot of things. You mind sharing a little bit just how you grew up and, you know, uh, what was it like and what made you go down the path, in particular finance, because we don't see a lot of women in the financial world. It's a very small percentage as a whole. Um, but I'd love for you to unpack that a little bit. Well, thank you for asking. I'm, I never think anybody's really going to be all that interested about me as a child, but um, it, in and it was actually very funny because I, in my proposal for the book, I had the story that I'm about to tell you in, uh, in, in, uh, in what I sent to MIT. And when they, they purchased the book, they said, and we don't want any of that personal stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, I, I appreciate your interest. So, you know, as, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm kind of an unusual first generation. I'm, I'm on both sides of my family, but from sort of different ethnicities. My mother was Italian is why you see me talking with my hands. My father, uh, my father was Armenian from Turkey. And so the, as you might imagine, the, there's a, unfortunately still only a very small population of Armenians left in Turkey, but they're really, really <laughs> quite uh, passionate about, um, about the, their ethnicity. So we would go back and visit my father's family in the summer. And I just, I had, I think it was I think it was the summer that I was 14 and we'd been going for you know for many years we were walking in my in my grandparents neighborhood you know a very you know nice middle class neighborhood and there were just poor children begging on the street cooking on the street they were you know they were our age they were my brothers and sisters and my age and it just hit me so hard that there was this kind of need just right alongside so much plenty in my my father's family. And then even worse, my aunts and uncles would just sort of like walk right by them. I mean, they didn't even notice them. They'd become so inured to, to that need right alongside their own lives. And, you know, without, without judgment, my father is no longer with us. But when I used to tell the story, it was upset him terribly that I was telling it. It's not 
was not so much criticism of them, but just a real commitment at a very early age. Like, I didn't want to be that person that walked by. Mm -hmm. I, that if I could do something, I wanted to do it. And so, uh, yeah, that's where that whole part of my, my motivation and career push <laughs> has come from. Love it. For asking. Uh, no, I, lo I love that. Because like I say, you know, when you hear people's stories from, you know, growing up, a lot of times it's influenced what they do in life and their why or their passion. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so for those that are listening, um, Mary Ellen, as you can tell, is a very humble individual. But last year, you I, I understand that you were um, voted Forbes 50 over 50 in the investment category. That just means I'm very old. <laughs> <laughs> we're, so, well, then we're all old sitting here. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's a great honor. When you found out, how did you feel? No, I, I was so surprised. I'm always a little bit surprised that like, you know, people in mainstream finance kind of even know about what we're trying to do. So it was a, it was really gratifying. And, and the, you know, the only thing... <laughs> <laughs> they had a big, beautiful party for us at this lovely, I think it was like the original, maybe the original Forbes home or something in, in, in Manhattan. And it ended up being this terrible super spreader event for COVID. <laughs> 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 so it was, this, you know, kind of, I, I, I managed not to get sick, but it had this kind of like, oh, what a shame. All these incredibly powerful women came together and they got sick from each other. <laughs> I love your energy. Oh, <laughs> Too funny. Too funny. Oh, I, so many, I love it. There's so many incredible points about your life and how you managed to get here. And I mean, at the age of 14, to be so observant and wanting to be able to make a difference is really special. Thank so, you. So thank you for being that special person yeah. no seriously usually people well it's it's just life right and you just move on from it and not mm -hmm. many people take action to be deliberate about having providing value and changing the lives of the less fortunate so that's yeah so thank you uh pretty, i'm glad you didn't get covered like the rest of them did um, no, i'm very lucky i've been very very healthy so thank you <laughs> mary ellen you, um do you have any questions for us I, no, I just am so grateful to you for giving me, you know, this opportunity to, to uh, speak with your audience. I mean, Charmaine, you have, I have told my, my publisher, there is an audience in South Africa. Yeah. We've got a book on there. So thank you for giving me that, that data point to show them. So thank you. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, I will help you promote your book here because I mean, as I said, I gravitated toward the book. Um, it is about women empowerment. It is about sharing so much information and, um, and there's need for it. There's need not just here in developing countries, all over the world actually, because our challenges are real. And, uh, and I'm glad you being the voice, speaking up and making a difference and bringing people together to create those opportunities where it moves people out of poverty. Um, and just that it, it, it may not mean a lot, but microfinance, no matter how little it is, women here in Africa utilize it in so many ways that benefit their families. And um, and for some people, it's like, oh, what can you do with so little money? Right. Trust right. me, the women here have done great things. Mm -hmm. So it is, so thank you for, for creating that. Any last words that you want to share or something that we may have missed that's important? Are there any projects or upcoming events that we could possibly support you or our, our listeners should be aware of? Or, yeah? yeah, well, thank you. Thank, thank you for that opportunity. I guess just the one thing I would, I would say, and I know it's a, it's a bit of a long way, but it's, it, it's worth mentioning. Um, our Making Finance Work for Women Summit, which is bringing all of our partners from around the world together. Um, first time in, we'll be together in three years in person. Um, it will be Dubai, February 14 to 16. So come spend Valentine's Day with a lot of <laughs> amazing um, men and women commit, committed to 
a, a more inclusive financial uh, financial sector. And then just one other little point that I think both of you touched on in important ways. I'm really excited that we were our board has given us the go ahead and we're now in the early stages of developing an impact fund to work on some of these issues in the United States. Because while that, you know, that that 97% of women, of, I'm sorry, of all Americans have a bank account, the issues of financial inequality are still enormous. And there's a, a wealth gap, not just gender related, but race, ethnicity. There's so many great areas that we can work and where there's some really exciting companies, mostly, most of them tech enabled companies that are starting to address these challenges. And we'd love to be um, nudging them in the direction of, of, uh, of supporting women. So that so stay tuned. That's coming, but that's, well, that's fabulous. Next, I love it. Next stage. I yeah. love it. So I just have one last question for you. Um, what advice, and we can pretty much get ready to end with that. What advice would you give to young women across the globe? Oh, that, thank you so much, um, Ed, for asking that question. I, I think uh, all of us could be can be better consumers of financial services. You know, if you do have a bank account, check to see whether there are any women on the board. Check to see whether there are any women in se in senior positions because they're and and I don't and if you saw only women there, that would be a mistake too. The diversity yeah. of opinion, the diversity of lived experience is going to provide you with better options to invest your money, a better place to save your money. Um, so I think just being a really smart consumer, an aware consumer um, of how the people who are providing you financial services are, are taking into consideration the fact that, that you are an important consumer. You Absolutely. are an important client yes. to them. Love it. Charmaine? I don't have any questions. I'm just very grateful, Mary Ellen, for you to yeah. coming through and sharing a piece of you. And um, yeah, you know, it's just been incredible. And thank you for the great work that you do. And um, we will definitely be in touch. I cannot wait to finish, just <laughs> first to receive you both yes. and to read it actually. So yeah. Great, great. It was really wonderful being with you. And I look forward to seeing this conversation uh, go, go, go large. So, yeah. So. We, we appreciate you. We thank you for all that you're doing out there for not just one community, but for communities across the globe. So thank you. So thank you. And it's, it's, it's selfless work. So we appreciate your value. This has been another Connected, Conversa Connected Ubuntu Conversation. Thank everyone for joining. We appreciate you. We love you. If there's any way that we can serve you, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Good day. Good night. Take care. <laughs>